Welcome back to Settlement Nation podcast and our All-Star series. I am Courtney Barber. Here with me is Chris Boer and a legendary trialer guest, Keith Mitnick. It feels very unnecessary, Keith, to have to even give you a big intro, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's a very special day for us. Keith Mitnick is the senior trial lawyer from Morgan & Morgan and is designated to assist other trial lawyers in his firm with their trials as well. He has over 100 trials under his belt, and I'm sure it's more than that by now. He has handled very high-profile cases and has landmark victories against huge corporations, including a $90 million verdict against a tobacco giant, which was also one of the top 10 verdicts for the country in that year. There are so many more verdicts we want to speak about today, so we're not going to give too much away in the beginning. Keith has been featured on 60 Minutes. He has written industry Bibles, including Don't Eat the Bruises and Deeper Cuts. And when he's not in trial, he can be found on the stage helping other plaintiff attorneys fight for justice and learn all his skills and strategies. We're so happy to have you, Keith. Welcome to Settlement Nation. I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're so happy to have you. I'm glad we got all those uh, technology problems out of the way in the beginning. And now it's just, we're ready to rock. We're ready to share your wisdom. We have 13,000 people that have listened to the podcast all over the country and in other countries as well. So Keith, I want to start with a little bit of a different question, but I did ask Nick this same question. So let's see how you both do. Um, I know that to get to your position, you know, it's never an easy ride and getting to success, you're always climbing mountains. But other than hard work, what has been the recipe to getting where you are today? That's a great question. I, I would say, here's something I always say there. When I was a, uh, a younger lawyer, I would try cases against other lawyers and I don't want to sound cocky, but after I'd learned the craft, I thought I'm better than them. And then I, they'd get up in front of a jury and they'd talk, the defense lawyer. And I think they don't, they talk just as good as I do. And I thought so, but I was still convinced I was better than them. <laughs> and I thought, why is that? Why am I, am I fooling myself? Is this ego? If if I am better than them, what separates me from other good talkers? Because let's face it, in, in the trial lawyer business, being a good talker is a dime a dozen and none of us want to be a dime a dozen. So what separates you? And I, and I really thought about it and I thought, I know what separates me and what can separate anybody if they, if they put their heart and mind and soul to it. And that is we can never fall in love with the talking side and forget the thinking side. I call it the art of outsmarting the fun part that sets you apart. And it's a catchy little phrase I came up with because I use it frequently when I'm talking about this kind of subject. But here's what I mean by it. The difference between you and that lawyer across who talks just as good as you or close to as good as you in the courtroom, maybe if you're younger, even better. But you can still be globally a better lawyer, more special, and be able to, aside from being better and special, more effective on behalf of justice in your clients, which is the part that really matters, is committing yourself to not painting by numbers, but be a master, be a, be a paint masterpieces, freehand it, which means free think it, which means always take the time to step into the defense lawyer's shoes and think how they think. And ask yourself, if I were going to lose this case, if I were to get a bad outcome, if it were to be a poor settlement, why? What are the defense's favorite facts? What is it if I lose, I'm going to probably lose because of one of these three, four, five things. And then commit a, a significant amount of your attention, focus, concentration, and however long it takes, talk to other people, bring others from your inner circle into the process and figure out how to not let them beat you. And that sounds like a position of weakness. It's not. You never want to try their case. You always want to try your case. But if you want to really try your case, figure out how to destroy their case while trying your case. And you can't, and that is the difference. When I walk into court, every now and then I got a defense lawyer who's a real thinker. And every time I get a leg up on them, they respond to it and they got a leg up on me and we go back and forth. I actually prefer trying cases against people like that because it's more of a challenge. 
but your run of the mill defense lawyer, honestly, they paint by numbers. They got a script. They do the same thing over and over, make a few adjustments. And there, you take them off their game. You take them out of their comfort zone and they're lost. And in the way you do it, the beauty of it is you don't do this part, most of it. Some of it's instincts in trial, but a, most of it is pre-planning. So the hot spotlights of the courtroom that can be so stressful, especially when you don't try a lot of cases or you're younger, that, that freezes the free thinking of your mind and you lose that asset. But if you commit to this before you ever walk into court, make a list. Here's how I'm going to win. Now make a list. Here's how I'm going to lose. What are the defense favorite facts? And then figure out, don't look at them and go, oh, damn it. Now I'm scared to try my case. I got problems. Look at them and figure out how can I own them? And if I can't own them, how can I absolutely show to this jury that in spite of that, whatever that is, in spite of that, we're still right overall. It doesn't change the fact we're right. Many times those things that seem like a problem are nothing but wannabe problems. You can actually wipe them off the face of the earth. You still have to deal with them. And some of them you can actually say, and to make matters worse and throw that fact in as one of your favorite facts. But even if it's just an ugly fact, you got to figure out how am I going to win in spite of it? And that is honestly, I had a, I was blessed to have a fantastic, two great mentors as a baby lawyer. One of them was a guy that said, if you don't read every piece of paper in your file before trial, if you don't overturn every stone, then I don't, he, it's 99% hard work and 1% talent. And that guy taught me to do the hard work. The other guy was a brilliant free thinker that outsmarted everybody he ever came in, in contact with. He was just so smart. He's old country boy. You'd never know it until you got to know him. He opened his mouth. You'd think he's old country hick. He was <laughs> scary smart. And he, I remember I'd come back from a deposition as a very, you know, right out of law school. And I'd say, John, something, so-and-so said this in the depo and it's terrible. And he'd say, man, Nick, what's the matter with you? That's not a bad fact. That's a good fact. Let me tell you why. And I got really, I didn't want to be humiliated by coming home and hearing that. So I learned before I'd take it to him, I'd try to figure out what was, how I could turn it into something good. And I'd bring it and he goes, well, I like the way you're thinking, you're working, you're still wrong dumbass let me tell you why we're right why that's good but after a while you i started adapting that sked that that thought process and now fast forward good god i don't know 37 years or something later i i, I think if the the son of a gun was alive today i could do it better than he can um because i just committed it's not because man you're so smart i just committed myself to the process and it's different most lawyers see a problem go, that's a reason to discount. All cases got problems. Don't accept it's a problem. Go after it with gusto. And I'm telling you, if you read my books, Don't Eat the Bruises and the recent one, uh, Deeper Cuts, which, by the way, anyone that's thinking I'll get the new one, I don't want the old one. It's like a, a getting an update in your app and your computer. The first <laughs> one is the mainframe. The second <laughs> one gives some updates that I'm actually more excited than the mainframe. But they got you got to have them. They work hand in hand. You can't you, hand in glove. You can't do one without the other. But so much, especially the uh, deeper cuts, the new one. I've just got a probably a third of the book on why these wannabe problems, the defense those as aren't problems at all. In another section of what I call false framing, which is how they create these false. This is how I'm going to win the case by answering this question, and it's a false question, and they're going to win it, but it's a bullshit question. So you spot these things in their games and you build a package outside of the pressure of the courtroom where you can access more experienced lawyers or equally experienced lawyers or just your spouse and talk to them about it and get feedback. And you get this perfect package before you ever walk in the courtroom. It's unassailable and it's brilliant. And it's usually not what the other side was expecting. And it swallows whole their entire case. Now, let them talk good. Because they're going to be talking to a wall and I'm going to run circles around their ass because of all that, this part, the up in your head part. And you know why I say the fun part that sets you apart? Because it's fun. You want to distinguish yourself. You can, everybody can learn to talk. Everybody can't learn to outsmart. It's a real art form. And it also, to me, is the most fun part. And I know this is your opening question. I'm going to eat up all our time, but it, <laughs> you are, you're talking to the heart of what Mitnick is. 
you I don't know whether Riley pointed you to this, but you found that that's the best opening question I've ever gotten in any interview. Because oh, per- I have, didn't even know. So there you, you go. Have, you have walked me into what is the center of my belief system, my ethos, is, as uh, as uh, Friedman would say, um, is is this piece of it. When you put this together, it truly will separate you from the pack and you'll have a blast. I carry these problems around in my head. And if I'm a I'm an anxious guy, I want to go, 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 go. I, I'm not a sit around guy and I want things done now. And 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 that's just I am. So if you put me in a car, I'm miserable. If you put me in an elevator and it's more than one floor and we've got slow doors, my head's gonna explode. I can't take it. I don't want to sit on this damn elevator. I don't want to be in a car. I want to be doing, doing, doing. But you know, I gave myself like a Zen Buddhist meditating piece. I carry these problems around like a New York Times crossword puzzle or a Sudoku puzzle. It's fun. And I always have two or three in reserve. I go on beach walks. I live over on the Atlantic Ocean in Florida, a place called Ponce Inlet. I go on the walk and the way down, I say my prayers and the way back, I'm working a problem. You know why? As gorgeous as the beach is, if I don't have something to occupy my mind, I'll find something to worry about and I'll be miserable. So I always have to have something to keep myself entertained. I, I'm on an elevator. I, I can't tell how many times I've rode from the second floor to our top floor where my office is in our building. And I'm back on the second floor and I go to step off. And I'm, what the hell the hell I get here? Because I'm instead of being anxious, I'm in deep thought. I can be in a dinner table with the most boring, boring people talking to you. And they think I'm the best listener in the world, even though I'm a big mouth. You know why? I've decided... <laughs> I, I, I'll work on my problem and I'm nodding and they think, God, he's so in tune. I'm over. I don't, I mean, listen to the shit. I'm working a problem. <laughs> so my point is, and I shouldn't say that. Nobody at dinner is going to be wondering if I'm doing it. If you're interesting, I don't do it. <laughs> anyway, my point is this isn't, Oh my God, I already got enough to do. This guy's giving me more work. I'm not, I'm giving you a piece of fun, make it fun. And you will be different. You will be special and you'll win a lot more cases and have a hell of a lot more fun. And one last thing, when you lose, because anyone says they never lose is a liar. And anyone that's good at this hates to lose. Healing from losing is one of the most difficult things of this practice. This is the greatest healer I've ever come up with. When I want to stop hating the, the, the injustice of it, you know what I do? I say, all right, what happened in that case that I can build on? What's a new something I have it? And next thing, I've thrown my entire life being into solving that new problem. And that's how I heal. Because I feel like, you know what? I hate to say this on a national broadcast, but Don't Eat the Bruises is not a book of victories. It's a book of losses. It was me healing. And guess what? I don't lose very often because of how I healed. But it was it was a healing process on the back end. If you need it, it's a, and you know what? I win. Now, after the celebration's done and you're sobered up, now what? Guess what? I'm going to take some things that I developed during that trial and make them even better for the next trial. And it's a never-ending process. So long answer to commit yourself to the art of outsmarting. Keith, all of that was fantastic. That could all be part one of this episode and everything to follow could be part (laughs) two. I do have other questions for you. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago, younger attorneys, a lot of our audience is younger attorneys. So we want to get into some questions that might help them in areas that they're struggling. One might be uh, voir dire. What, um, what kind of questions do you ask in that, in that process? I know you think that's a, obviously a really important part of the trial. So um, what tips would you have for younger attorneys that might struggle with that? I'm a, can I start with a basic uh, encouragement for younger lawyers, then we'll morph it into voir dire. Cause this it, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing, board hour, opening, closings, a witness. This this is my best advice to a younger lawyer. I wish someone had whispered it to me when I was younger because I was so hard on myself when I was young. I wanted to be perfect. I was being taught by some badass lawyers and I wanted to be as good as they were. And you just can't be right out of the box. Um, uh, it, there's just certain parts of it. Take a, take a while. Take some experience. Take some mistakes and you learn from them. And and, and so if I didn't do something perfect, I really beat myself up. And they didn't help much because they beat me up. They'd help me beat myself up. And um, my advice that I wish I'd have known because I would have 
enjoyed my younger years more. And don't get me wrong, I loved them. But there was a there was a lot of self flagellation going on along with the loving the learning. The piece I would have given myself, and I'd like to give everybody that's younger now, is it's not about being pretty. What do I mean by that? I don't mean having your hair done nice and getting your teeth whitened. I mean polished, not your teeth, your craft. It's not about your presentation being polished and perfect. Do you want to get there? Do you want and look, you're never going to get perfect at it. Do you want to get more and more to where you walk in a room and do it and people, wow, that, that they're really good and leave them talking. Yeah, you want to leave them talking. I want to leave them the court reporter and the judge and the bailiff talking for the next 10 years. But that ain't what it's about. That's pure professional satisfaction to make it sound pretty and to cut to the chase's ego. And look, we all got eager. We wouldn't be standing up in front of a group of people trying to change people's minds for a living. But it's, you got to have a healthy dose of it to do what we do. But if it's what drives you, you're in the wrong profession. Go, go be a politician or something. This is driven by a hatred for injustice and a passion and love for justice. So how do you as a young lawyer say, I don't want to shortchange my client because I really believe it's the client comes first, not me. And I'm not really ready to do it pretty and perfect or po- or even wow people. Here's the peace of mind. It's not about the polish. That juror doesn't care. You can get the same outcome with just about the same probability or me or Nick Rowley or, or you know, Rick Friedman or, or any of them. You can go, Don Keenan, you can go down the list. I know I'm leaving somebody I wished I didn't out, but my point is your senior lawyer in your office who you are so impressed when they do their thing, you can have just as good a chance as winning as they can because the jury isn't given, isn't deciding, holding up a card to how good the lawyer was. Ten, nine. They're after the truth and what feels right. And here's the exciting part. When you recognize it's okay to stumble and bumble and start and stop and freeze and not have to look something up and, and, and say something that's stupid and have to take it back and people snicker. It can actually be charming when you're young. If I did it, it with my bald head, people laugh at me now. But it, when you're younger, it's, it, it's endearing. So what does make a difference if it's not the polish? It's the package. And like I said just a few minutes ago, I won't go back into in detail, but you can create the package, that unassailable, brilliant package where you're using the art of outsmarting. You don't need to have, have 20 years of experience and great instincts. Because you know what? You can walk down to the end of the hall and ask your, your boss who does. You can call a friend who's done it longer, got more experience. And again, a whole lot of it has nothing to do with just lawyer stuff. It has to do with people stuff. Talk to your spouse, your friends, you know, your Uber driver. And, and you keep trying your ideas out before you really do them. And there's no spotlight on you. There's no stress while you're doing this. This is There's no wrong answer. Come up with the dumbest idea ever. Who cares? You didn't say it to the jury and someone will catch you and you'll throw that one out. So take the opportunity before you get into court to get that winning package put together and access the the resources around you to make sure it's right. And then when you walk in court with a winning package, you only need one other thing to win. Your integrity, your sincerity, your realness, that gives you authority. And if you come in and those jurors go, you know what, that young lady, you can tell she's nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rockers, and she's stumbling and stammering, and she can't. But you know what? The words, when she gets them out, are really convincing. I think she's right. And you know what? She believes in it. I know that girl believes in it. That jury is, you're going to be the underdog. They're going to pull for you. But the, what they're going to decide on is the package, and what they're going to follow is the person who's a straight shooter. If you're the straight shooter, and you don't need 20 years experience to be an honest straight shooter, for God's sake, if, if you're a sneaky snake, be a defense lawyer. Don't do our side. So you're born, by the way, are we talking to plaintiffs here or both sides? Plaintiffs. Okay, I want to be careful. Every now and I've got them said that stuff, and they've got a room full of mixed. Oh, you can you can say whatever you want. Plaintiffs only. Kate. Oh, listen, half the defense lawyers are friends of mine. I, I go hard on them in these things. 
because I don't like what they stand for, but they're making a living. You know, most of them are decent people. They're not, they just, that's how they, they don't even like it. Most of them themselves. But in any event, my point is for the young lawyer, give yourself the break. I didn't give myself. It's okay that it's sloppy. So long as you got a package and you've got your integrity intact, which you, you can build the package when you're young by accessing the older folks and your integrity should come with you. Naturally, you're born with it. Your parents taught it to you. Just don't forget it in the courtroom. And if you bring those things together, honestly, you and I could try a case in companion courtrooms and video on both. And I bet you the outcome wouldn't be a lick difference, even though mine would, you know, maybe look a little more impressive. Who cares other than you? And you want to care. It's not going to change the outcome. So that's the starting point to this. And I'll give you one last little, little piece to that. Lawyers ask me, you know, it, things are going so fast and there's so much to remember. How do you keep it all straight? And, and the first time I got asked that, what popped in my head is I, I think about the, the college athletes come out, the football players come out of high school and they're all Americans. They go to college and, you know, they aren't that good for the first year. Why? Because the game, what do they say every time? The game's so fast. It's so much faster. You hear the one and done kid who, who's played at, at Kentucky in basketball and he was Mr. Everything and he goes to the pros and, you know, can't hit the side of a bar. And I think it's the same damn goal. What's the problem? They'll tell you the game's so much faster. Our game's fast as hell. That's what's scaring you. But here's the good news. Bring the package, bring your integrity. And even though the game's moving faster and you can keep up with it, it won't, it won't mean you've hurt your client. You're still going to bring them justice most of the times. And if you didn't, your boss probably wouldn't have either. But the game starts slowing down pretty quick. Go try three trials. You will be shocked how much the game slowed down after three, not 10 years. One trial, it slows down. Two, it's three. It's like, this ain't fast anymore. It's not so far off for it to slow down. It's pretty close. But here's the last little piece of that. You would think, okay, if, it, if, if it's going to slow down for three years, I'm going to be bored if I'm going to do it for 30 more. No, you're not. It just keeps slowing down. And then you reach a point where you're looking back at it and you're you're really at full stride and you got 10, 20 or whatever it is under your belt and, the, and your instincts fire so fast. You're like Neo in Matrix. You see the bullets coming in slow motion. You say, all right, I could do this or I could do that. No, I think I'm going to do this. And everybody else it happened in a snap of a finger to you. It was slow motion. That's what you have to look forward to. So that's my talk to the younger less or or let some people come into it later in life and they're just less experienced. That's the underlying key. Now convert it to voir dire. Voir dire, I believe, and cross-examination the right way are probably the two hardest skills to really get down. Um, and they're they're the most intimidating until you kind of master them. But they don't let the intimidation scare you off. There are two kinds of fear. There's the fear that debilitates you and there's the fear that motivates you. Use the motivational kind to light a fire on you behind. Don't don't cower away from it. So the big key to speaking to the jury is the same thing, and it isn't about being polished. You have to have your integrity. Shoot straight with the people. Have the conversation with the people. And there are systems out there. Lisa Blue has done some wonderful stuff on on jury selection. Um, you know, Nick Riley has. Um, um, everybody. Uh, 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 Don Keenan has. Um, there's a bunch of good stuff out there in jury selection, not to self promote, but one of the best out there on jury selection, because I've just spent so much time focused on it because I try so many cases. I mean, I try maybe 16 cases a year, jury trials, that I've got a system that I intentionally created, not for for just the senior lawyer, but for anybody. And here's what, if you just will get, don't eat the bruises and study that and get, I know that, that getting them both gets expensive, but also get deeper cuts because I took the Vord some new stuff that excites the hell out of me on Vordire is in that, that isn't in the first one because it is a constantly developing process. But if you will take the simple, the systems in there that I say simply work, they're not simple, but they're not hard to do. They're actually complex, but they're not hard to do and they have great results. So that's why I say that simply work. 
And if you look at those, here's what I hear back from the younger lawyers. First time out, they say, I swear it worked good. And I felt clunky. Second time they out, they'll tell me, it, I, I almost felt like it was mine. Third time out, they'll say, I took your stuff and I did some different things that felt better to me. And let me tell you, I ran off 16 unfair jurors and we got a great. It's again, I don't know what the magic of three t- times out is. So on board, Dyer, I know it's scary. All you're doing is talking to people and you're trying to get people to honestly acknowledge grounds to get rid of those that are biased for cause, not because they're bad people, because we, hell, I, there are cases I ought not be on, I'd be biased. So the little story at the front end that are in those books, I won't go into now, it'll take up too much time. You tell a little story, it's a little analogy, um, and suddenly the jurors go, oh, I get it. You're not asking me if I'm an unfair person. You're just asking me and be honest about the limitations human beings have depending on their beliefs and feelings. And then you'll talk to them and you get some. If you get four for cause, you got four more than most of the older lawyers did when I was growing up. So don't be scared of it. Throw, Get in there and do it. It's going to be scary, but it's okay. There no, there's really no right and wrong to it. But study some of the writings on it and get your confidence level up in the structure. And I don't believe in telling war stories about it. I want to give you a system that can be dropped down in any lawyer's lap in any case and have it be very helpful. And so there are some really quick to learn systems in there that'll build your confidence and you just got to go pick juries. I love that. So I want to turn this back, the focus back to you, Keith. Let's talk about one memorable case that you've had. Now, maybe it was a complete train wreck, but you learn a lot from it or something that from the beginning, it just was like you had the magic touch and everything went your way. So you can decide which way you want to go with this question, can good or bad. Hog? Can I be a hog and give you one of both? You can. All right. All this jury selection stuff, the reason I would, I really would like to skip the, the train wreck one. But <laughs> I, I want to get to the second one, but, but, I'm going to tell you the train wreck one because it everything I just said about jury selection started with this case. And I was a young lawyer. Two years out of law school, I tried my first first chair med mal case. It wasn't first year. I was the only chair. Uh, my boss, who was dying of cancer, was in the back of the room if I needed him, but he wasn't even sitting at the table with me. And then my second one, and I, I got a good result. I was happy. Then my second one, I'm over there trying to case first chair with a, a lawyer who's actually went to my law school. I got him the job. So he didn't know any damn more than I did. We were both way too young. And the weight of the world was on me because the client trusted me and said, you know, whatever you think. And I was going to get my first million, million dollar verdict before I turned 30. And this was a case. It was a good case. And, um, we were in the middle of a tort reform crisis in, it wasn't a tort reform crisis, a made up fake, phony, fraudulent tort reform crisis in Florida, one of many where they got tort reform. And they had the worst ads you've ever seen. They had all these fat lawyers smoking cigars, playing poker in his smoke filled room, loud and laughing, and a mom couldn't get her baby delivered. And it was that, and there were a bunch of them. That was maybe the worst one. And it was all about med mal. They needed, they were trying to get these votes in the legislature. They were trying to pass this law. Um, and um, I'm picking a jury as a young lawyer. All I know in jury selection was how to um, sell your case, you know, and be charming. Um, I didn't know a damn thing about establishing cause challenges. And I had a room full of people who were livid against malpractice cases. And I did the one thing you can't do, which is, I tried to change their mind. I tried to tell them how wrong they were. I tried to tell them, McDonald's, you don't know all the facts on McDonald's. Let me tell you. And and you know what I did? I got a bunch of people who answered the question, yeah, I'll be fair, um, who weren't going to be fair uh, because, you know, I didn't know how to ask them. But honestly, back then, these systems weren't developed. You know, mine or Lisa's or whoever else has developed them out. And there's some of the smart jury consultants who come up with great stuff, the, the David Balls of the world. None of that was a new science. It wasn't out there then. And so I lost the case. Um, and it, there's not a, I used to say there's not a week goes by. Probably now at this point, maybe a, not a month goes by that I don't think about it. And it's just a gaping hole in my heart. Uh, the clients were so 
classy and mispermitting and not your fault. You Because I tried a good case. I whooped them. I was just playing to deaf ears. And um, they were so kind to me that it almost made it worse. I felt so bad. I, I sincerely thought we were, it was the case worth a lot more than they were offering, but they were offering some decent money. Um, so I came out of that just gut-wrenching. And look, my dad came to see it. My dad never – I played football. And I was a good football player. My dad never watched me play football. He didn't care about it, never came. He never watched anything I did. He wasn't a bad man. He just had his own thing going on. This is the first thing he ever came to see me do. He came and watched one thing, the Vore Dyer. And he wasn't one to hold his criticism. So, you know, like a week later, I'm still just raw as hell over eating dinner at my parents' house. And I hear my mom say, Nick, not no, no. And we walk outside and he has to tell me, you, th- you know, the way you handle that jury questioning stuff, trying to get people to tell them they were wrong, is not the way to do it. I'm going, you know, it was like someone kicked me in the stomach. Um, and, and he never came back and saw me again. So he's passed away. And I think all the time, Dad, thank you because you lit a fire under my ass. And I hope you're looking down now and may be proud of me this time. But I came out of that case and I realized I was a talented young lawyer. I beat him in the courtroom. I lost it in jury selection. And I realized there's got to be a better way to do this. I've got to figure out a way to I. You only in Florida we get three peremptory challenges. We can get rid of three people for whatever reason. Well, you got thirty biased jurors. Your three are a joke. So I realize I've got to come up with a way to establish valid cause challenges so the judge will take them off for cause. And I know you can't just say, "Will you be fair?" Because everyone's going to say, "Of course I can be fair." So all the things I d- develop, my German Shepherd story, my mustard-based barbecue story, my it's 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 not so much a uh, dispute over facts as it is dispute over conclusions from facts, and people's feelings and beliefs have a big impact in that space between the facts and the conclusion reached on it. And I've come, I realized I can't give a forty-minute lecture on this. This isn't a classroom on bias. It's got to be quick or the judge is going to shut you down. So I came up with these simple little stories and analogies that take all of two minutes at most. And all of a sudden, jurors go, oh, I get it. And the person who's going to want to sit on your jury and tank it is going to lie to you. But that's not most of the jurors that are your problem. You, that, you can get them on a peremptory. Most of them are honest, good people who just aren't going to be fair on your case because of their beliefs and they have a right to them. And when you educate that honest, good person about how they didn't realize that's going to have an unintended impact on them potentially, they will say, yes, this isn't the right case for me. And now you're starting to move out 15, 20 people. And now what's left, I have a fair jury. So, so much of that came from that heartbreaking experience. So when you have a heartbreaking experience, Turn it into a catalyst for change and better. Now, let me, I'll spend less time on the last one because there weren't any great lessons. It's just something I'm, I, I, I do think about this one damn near every week. Uh, and we took on the cigarette industry the first time. We've done it a bunch since, but the very first time. And, you know, they're the most powerful defense machine in history. They've been defending, I mean, they got a product that addicts people and kills, you know. And it has for a hundred and something years. I mean, they've been getting their ass sued forever. And they have got it down to a science. They have got good lawyers, but it isn't that they got the best lawyers. They got an unbelievably good system. Um, and they adapt it all the time. They focus group everything. It's just they're, they're very, very, very formidable. And we took them on the first time. And we're taking on guys who spent their life defending those cases. We'd never try one in our lives. And I remember the night before closing argument. And I, I, I talked to my wife and she was a court reporter for 20 plus years and is understands this business. She's been in front of more jurors than I have and really gets it. She's very, very wise. Um, and I'm, she's, you know, how, how you, what are you going to do with clothes and how you feel? And I got to where I couldn't talk. I started sobbing. She said, are you okay? I said, I'll call you back. She said, are you okay? I said, I can't talk. I'll call you back. And I got my, bearings back and called her in five minutes because I knew she's worrying what the hell am I having a heart attack or something so I called her back and said she says what's the matter I said the weight of this case I I said you know I've had so many closings I probably had a hundred trials by then I said but the weight of letting these people off on my watch I just 
I can't take it. I mean, I feel this responsibility, this society, this is such an important case where we have a chance to make a difference, not with one case, but a chain of these big cases against them. And I don't want to be the broken chain. And the cases are so hard. And I thought, God, if we lose this, I I just don't know how I'm going to take it. You know, it'd be like backing up over your pet or something. I'm like, how am I going to deal with this? And it really broke me down. And I got back and delivered one of the best closing arguments in my career the next day. And we ended up with a $90 million verdict. And and I would say that I, I've had much, much smaller verdicts that are way up there in my list. This one isn't up there just because it was so big. It was up there because of what it stood for in my heart. I've stood up. These people are the epitome of why I went to law school, why I do what I do. And I finally came face to face with my arch enemy. And that one and one big will always be one of those things. When I'm on my grave, I'll count as a thank you for that opportunity. Wow, how awesome is this episode so far in part one of our All-Star series with Keith Mitnick. I hope you are learning a lot. I know I certainly did. Stay tuned for part two, which is coming out very soon. And thank you once again for supporting Settlement Nation Podcast.